A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillahi Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim This presentation is on the 99 beautiful names of Allah as described in the book by Imam Ghazali Rahmatullahi The last two presentations were on physics. We now progress into metaphysics and draw from our understanding of physics. At the core of metaphysics is the 99 names of Allah. In the tapestry of creation, each thread reflects a facet of the infinite. The 99 names of Allah, as illuminated by Imam Ghazali, are not merely names, but gateways to understanding the boundless nature of Allah and the creation itself. They offer us a map to navigate the complexities of life, inviting us into a deeper communion with Allah. Through these names, we discover compassion in adversity, wisdom in trials, and the profound interconnectedness of all things. This presentation is an invitation to explore, reflect, and transform as we delve into the profound depths of the 99 names of Allah. Prepare to open your mind and heart to the infinite possibilities of understanding the world around you. The outline of this presentation is as follows. First, we will go through the introductory notes by Imam Ghazali, then the categorization of the names to make them easier to understand, then a summary of each category, in, a, in particular how to recognize and embody the names of Allah, and finally a way forward. There were several introductory and epilogue chapters in Imam Ghazali's book on the 99 names and this section is a summary of those chapters. The source of Allah's names are from both the Quran and Hadith. As narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, Allah has 99 names, that is 100 minus 1, and whoever believes in their meanings and acts accordingly will enter paradise. And Allah is wither, and Allah loves the wither, that is odd numbers. And this is a hadith that is in Sahih al-Bukhari. And although the concept of Allah's names was present in the teachings of the past Anbiya alayhi salam, the specific enumeration of 99 names is only in the Ummah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the list of which is narrated in several ahadith. There are other names mentioned in the Quran which are not on the 99 names list. Example, Al-Mawlid, Al-Nasir, Al-Ghalib, Al-Qarib, Al-Rab, and Al-Nasir. Other names like Al-Dayan, Al-Hannan, Al-Mannan are also mentioned in various hadith. Imam Ghazali suggests that the names derived from Allah's actions as described in the Quran are virtually endless, indicating the vastness and depth of how Allah can be known. And the idea is that Allah possesses many names beyond human understanding, which are known only to Him. The Ism al-Azam, or greatest name, was known in some academic circles, it is said, to some of the Prophets, and in other academic circles, they say it was to all of the Prophets. And we know it was also made known to certain saints of the past. So here's what we know about the Ism al-Azam. It is believed to encompass all of Allah's attributes and powers. It embodies the essence of His being and His relationship with creation. Some hadith suggest that invoking the Ism al-Azam guarantees the acceptance of a prayer. Hence, its revelation has been entrusted to prophets and saints. It is told in a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, The supreme name of Allah is in these two Quranic verses. Your Allah is one Allah. There is no Allah save him, the infinitely good, the merciful. The dua of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, My Allah, I pray to you for every name that belongs to you and by which you call yourself. Every name that you send down in your book, that you made known to any of your creatures or that you hold with you in the hidden treasure of your science. This dua implies that there are numerous other names of Allah. Imam Ghazali now poses the question. Now it may be asked, why is it that 99 of the names have been singled out for a peculiar role in this matter? Although all the others are names of Allah, may he be praised and exalted. We would say, 
It is possible for names to differ in excellence because their meanings differ in eminence and distinction, so that 99 of them will bring together varieties of meanings which tell of the divine majesty which another set of meanings would not be able to bring together, and so this combination is possessed of the greater distinction. Now we will look at the distinctiveness of the names of, of Allah. Even though some of the names may appear similar and inter interrelated in meaning, in reality each name is distinctive. Example, al ghafir which is the forgiver, al ghafur the all-forgiving, and al ghafar the ever-forgiving, and that each name has only a single meaning. Other names, though ostensibly similar, are used differently in the Arabic language. For example, the usage of the great Al-Kabir and the tremendous Al-Azim are not interchangeable. The difference in usage suggests that each name encapsulates a specific aspect of divinity that is not entirely captured by any other name, thus ruling out the possibility of them being mere synonyms. Some names may have multiple meanings, hence it is important to discern the most appropriate meaning of the name in the context in which it is being used. Example, Al-Mu'min, the faithful, could also mean the giver of faith or the giver of security. It is easy to understand how to manifest attributes like Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim outwardly. However, names like Ad-Dar, the one who can cause loss, and Al-Mundakim, the one who takes retribution, are meant to be manifested by the Muslim inwardly on his own nafs. Allah's Uniqueness The more you know the meaning of the likeness denied of Allah, which is His being, His art, great and glorious, the more you will know that there is no likeness of Him. In Surah Ashura, the verse comes, Not is as His likeness. And this is implied in terms of his being. Jumayr al-Baghdadi was right when he remarked, Only Allah knows Allah. Hence, we only get to know more of Allah through his, through his attributes, but not knowing him direct, directly or personally as such. The Master of Men, the Prophet wasallam, may Allah's blessing and peace be upon him, said, I cannot enumerate your praise. You are as you have praised yourself. Our descriptions of Allah using human-like attributes allow us only a limited understanding based on our experiences. And just as we cannot fully grasp the realities of death, paradise, or hell without experiencing, without experiencing them, so too is our comprehension of Allah's true essence inherently limited, necessitating an approach that acknowledges His attributes while recognizing our description's limitations. When we describe Allah using human-like attributes, we are only able to understand Him through our own experiences and perceptions. But, Imam Ghazali says, I would go even further and say, no one knows the essential reality of death or of paradise or of hell until after death when one enters into paradise or hell. For paradise is equivalent to a source of pleasure, and if we were to posit a person who had never experienced any pleasure, it would be utterly impossible for us to make him understand paradise with an understanding which would awaken in him a desire to seek it. Hell is equivalent to a source of suffering, and if we were to posit that a person who had never suffered pain, it would not be possible for us to make such a person understand what hell is. But if he has suffered it, we can make him understand it by comparing it to the worst pain he has ever suffered, namely the pain of fire. This understanding is inherently limited and inadequate. There is a need for a dual approach in understanding Allah, which is acknowledging Allah's attributes while also understanding the limitations of these descriptions. We should recognize that while we use terms like living, powerful, and knowing, etc. for Allah, his essence and the reality of these attributes are far beyond our comprehension. Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu pointed out when he said, The failure to attain perception is itself a perception.
Ibn Arabi Rahmatullahi has two concepts that he formalized to aid our understanding in this matter. One is the concept of Tanzi or incomparability, which is to recognize that Allah's essence is unknowable and cannot be compared. The second is the concept of Tashbih, which means imminence, so that while his essence is unknowable, he can still be recognized through his names being manifested in the creation. Well, Imam Ghazali Rahmatullahi goes on now to describe the three levels of living things, beasts, man, and angels, and their levels of perceptions of Allah. Beasts are at the lowest level of living beings. Their perception is limited to sensory experiences, which require physical contact or proximity. Their actions are driven primarily by instinctual desires like passion and anger. In other words, they are dominated by their nafs. Since they have very limited ability to reason, which means that they also have limited higher spiritual faculties. On the other end, we have the angels, and they represent the highest level. They are not constrained by physical bodies or limitations like proximity or distance. Their perception transcends physical senses, and they are not driven by passions or anger, as they do not have enough. Their actions are motivate, motivated by a desire to be close to Allah, which is a more exalted purpose. Humans are positioned between beasts and angels, as man is composed of both bestial qualities through his nafs, as well as angelic qualities through his higher spiritual faculties like his kalb, ruh, etc., etc. Initially, humans are more like beasts relying on sensory perception and driven by passion and anger. However, as they develop reason, they begin to transcend these limitations. And if man conquers passion and anger to the point of controlling them, and they become too weak to move him or pacify him, and accustoms himself to perceiving things too exalted to be attained by sense or imagination, he then attains a likeness to the angels and hence closer to Allah. In other words, meaning that humans need to transcend the limitations of the nafs by developing their higher spiritual faculties. There is the example of Hazrat Abdul Qadir Jailani Rahmatullahi who did not eat for 40 days. In so doing, he conquered his passion for eating and he attained angelic qualities. That level of extreme fasting though is not recommended for today. In fact, in doing so, it makes easier to practice the 99 names of Allah. Basically, when man controls his nafs and develops his higher spiritual faculties, this leads him closer to Allah. So how do we relate to Allah's names? The names attributed to Allah aren't just ordinary labels, but are loaded with profound meanings. Each name reveals something unique about Allah, such as his omniscience, omnipotence, benevolence, etc. The names shape how we perceive and categorize the world around us. The names are used in zikr, muraqaba, and in religious discourse, encouraging us to reflect deeply on the nature of Allah, thereby enhancing our spiritual connection to Allah. Take note that human language is limited in its capacity to fully describe the infant and transcendent, transcendent nature of Allah. Imam Ghazali Rahmatullahi then goes on to list the obstacles to the understanding of Allah's names. The first, he says, is inadequate knowledge or certainty that the attribute in question is one of the attributes of majesty and perfection. The second is that the heart is filled with another longing and is absorbed by it. So it is necessary for the one who would contemplate the attributes of Allah Most High to have emptied his heart of desiring anything except Allah, great and glorious. Your glorification of Allah will not be authentic until you detach from your soul every reprehensible passion and free your faith from deficient deeds, your mind from earthly desires, your heart from the darkness of negligence, and your body from vices, transgressions, the eating of forbidden foods, and dubious conduct. It will be then that every name of the attributes of the essence and every name of the attributes of the acts 
will be reflected in you with all their grandeur and might. This slide and the next subsumes the whole of Tasawuf. Everything that we see in all the Tasawuf Kitabs is the how-to of these two slides. So the objective is to mirror Allah's attributes. Simply hearing, reciting and understanding the words and linguistic meanings of Allah's names or just believing in them without deeper understanding is not enough for true spiritual fulfillment. Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah states, The perfection and happiness of man consists in conforming to the perfections of Allah Most High, in adorning himself with the meanings of Allah's attributes and names, insofar as this is conceivable for man. This means that man can manifest Allah's attributes in a limited manner, and that every attribute we try to manifest is a door that opens to the proximity of Allah, hence the emphasis on good character in Islam. The path to spiritual proximity is to recognize and embody Allah's attributes in our daily life. The proximity or closeness to Allah is in terms of character traits. It's not about spatial closeness. And this is experienced in three ways. Firstly, to memorize the names, learn their meanings, and implement their counsel. In this way, man becomes lordly and a companion to the angels. The same applies to making the dabur of the verses of the Quran regarding Allah's names as well as general verses. Reflect on the names manifested in creation. And basically, a zikr, muraqaba, and action of the names is required. The Sheikh Abul Naib al Baghdadi Rahmatullah, who was a contemporary of Ibn Arabi Rahmatullah, would order the disciple Murid to sit in front of him and get the Murid to recite to him the most beautiful names of Allah one or more times as he saw fit, and while observing his, the Murid's face. If he observed that the Murid's face was not moved by reciting the names of Allah, he would say to him, Go out to the Sukh, which is the marketplace, and attend to earthly affairs, for verily you walk not this path. And if he observed in the Murid that he was impressed by hearing a specific name or names, he would command him to persevere in the zikr of those names, for by continuity he would increase the effect produced. This is what is perceptible, for the souls being different for each of them corresponds a name in a specific manner. So when the souls occupy themselves in that condition which corresponds to them, their departure from the earthly takes place through the virtue of the name in an easy and simple manner. Then Imam Ghazali says, the next level is those who so highly esteem what is disclosed to them of the attributes of majesty, that their high regard releases a longing to possess these attributes. So, they move closer to the truth in quality, not in place. And with the possession of such characteristics, they become similar to the angels. The next level is, as Imam Ghazali says, knowledge of these meanings by way of witnessing and unveiling, that is, mystical states, through the process of kash and mushahada so that their essential realities are clarified for them by a proof which does not permit any error, the greatest thing that a human being can experience with their higher spiritual faculties. And here he goes to, on to say how great a difference there is between this unveiling and a faith which is derived from one's parents and teachers by conformity and persistence in it, and even though it be accompanied by argumentative proofs from the Kalam. Also, as was mentioned earlier, that human language is limited in its ability to, to describe Allah's attributes. Hence, what Allah reveals to the servant goes beyond language. So know this well and consider it with your intelligence. Meditate on its meanings and you will gain its riches. The letters are the basis of control in the world of creation. And in the detachment of the soul, they have one sublime effect, which is what constitutes that abode. He who knows their secrets, when he focuses his attention on each 
one of the names by means of the object that represents it until the figure of the name and his corporeal image disappears from his mind and its spiritual image appears before him. It is at that moment that the peculiar essence of that name is manifested to him. And when he performs that name's constant repetition with his heart and tongue many times, there takes place in his soul a virtue of magnificence and dominion, of extension and attraction. And it is to Allah that we ask for help and to whom we shall return. The process of unveiling and witnessing in Imam Ghazali's framework can be seen as a means through which one can access or experience Ibn Arabi's God's vast earth. In this context, Ibn Arabi's God, God's vast earth serves as a, the riyam or state of realization where the truths unveiled by kashf are witnessed. It is where the seeker comes to a deep experiential understanding of the names of Allah. And more of this will be discussed in the next presentation on Islamic mysticism. The levels of the saints correspond to the degree of unveiling or kash of the ultimate reality. So what are the steps in the progression along this path? Firstly, contemplating Allah's most beautiful names makes us realize human impermanence versus Allah's permanence. This leads to a mental shift from a self-centered existence to a divine-centric state. This journey needs to be approached with awe of Allah's majesty and a deep love for Him. This underscores the importance of making shukr for Allah's bounties to start off this path because this leads to a sense of love for Him. Understanding signs and natural phenomenon in the universe and in the world gives appreciation for Allah's majesty, hence the previous astronomy and quantum physics presentations. This opening step also presupposes that one is conforming to Allah's commands and abstaining from sin. This is the tortuous path that the Sheikh would guide the Murid on, and probably the most challenging aspect for the Sheikh is to get the Murid onto this path in the first place. Next, the diversity of Allah's names allows individuals to find the name of Allah that resonates with their own situation and spiritual quest. If you don't feel yourself being drawn to some name of Allah, then something is wrong, because the multitude of conditions that continually descend on a person are all manifestations of Allah's name, and hence there absolutely must be some name that resonates with your current condition. Then, once a name is identified, harmonizing with that single name can even lead to a total spiritual disposition because each name acts as a conduit through which divine knowledge and the essence of creation flows. This requires total attention of the heart and patience. Ibn Arbi makes the point of Qiyam al Mana bil Mana, which means understanding something not by its physical appearance, but by the deeper meaning or essence that it represents. It's about feeling or experiencing those qualities directly in our lives. For example, when you feel truly at peace or deeply loved, that's like experiencing Allah's mercy without seeing it in a physical form. Think about eating something sweet from your childhood days, which you have not had since then. The sweet is not only about the taste, but more about the feelings and the memories that it brings up. Next, the contemplation of this name will not be full as long as it does not cause a person incapacity and perplexity before the object of that contemplation due to the profound mysteries and entities that are unveiled. And this normally happens in an altered state of consciousness. One of the students of the Sheikh Awad al-Din Balyani Rahmatullahi, who was a contemporary of Ibn Arabi Rahmatullahi, was in a retreat on a mountain. A snake came near him and the student tried to grab hold of it. The snake bit him and his limbs began to swell. The Sheikh came to know about this and sent for his student. He then said to him, Why did you grab hold of the snake so that it bit you? Oh Master, replied the student, You yourself said that there is nothing but Allah. On seeing the snake, I saw only Allah. 
plucking up courage, I grabbed hold of it. The Sheikh replied, When Allah manifests himself to you under the aspect of terrifying power, run away. Don't approach him. Otherwise, the same thing will happen to you again. Then he sat him down and said to him, Hold back from acting so boldly until you know Allah perfectly. After that, he recited some invocations and blew on the student. The swelling went down and the student was healed. This point is quite important because a commonly and correctly leveled criticism against the Sufis is that they supported a fatalistic attitude towards Allah's predestination, which resulted in passivity and inactivity. However, this applies to those Sufis who have not yet reached a perfect and proper understanding of Allah's name. For if they did, they would realize the name Al-Muqaddim, that is the one who advances, which implores one to bring order in themselves and in the world around them. Once this contemplation is done, there is a spiritual ascension and realization through the harmonization with Allah's names that leads to the ultimate identification with the name Allah because the name Allah encapsulates the essence of the divine, distinct from all other names that describe attributes rather than the essence. And this is why the Sufis regard themselves as the enlightened ones. Because firstly, they know that there is a path in the first place. They know the route along this path, and on finally getting there, are imbued with the nur of the kash that they have been endowed with, leading them to regard themselves as being enlightened. The end state goal posited by Imam Ghazali is that the knowledge of Allah by creatures is compared to seeing the light of the sun. Everything exists through the light of Allah's power. And so a person deeply immersed in witnessing Allah's actions may say, I only know Allah, as everything they perceive is a manifestation of Allah. Abu Yazid al-Bastami alayhi's phrase, I have shed my own self like a snake sheds its skin, and when I looked, I realized I am he, suggests that when someone lets go of their personal desires, they become completely filled with the presence of Allah. Their heart is occupied only by Allah's greatness and beauty. In such a state, a person feels deeply united with Allah, feeling as if they are part of him, but this does not mean that they literally become Allah. Man's manifestations of the attributes of Allah can only ever be achieved to a partial level. The person with the highest level of human embodiment of Allah's attributes was the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Imam Ghazali Rahmatullahi qualifies his end state goal in the following way where he says that different people will have different understandings and reflections of Allah's attributes based on what has been revealed to them of his marvels and signs in both the visible and invisible world. He gives the example of a professor's porter and disciple. The porter, akin to a common believer, has a basic general understanding of the professor's greatness. The disciple, on the other hand, has a deep and detailed understanding of the professor's knowledge and attributes. Just as the disciple knows more about the professor than the porter does, prophets and the pious have a more profound and detailed knowledge of Allah's signs and works in the heavens and the earth, and this knowledge enhances their closeness to Allah. This does not mean that they become Allah in the same way as the disciple does not become the professor. So for example, if you love someone deeply and get to know every intimate detail about them, then you feel as if you have become this other person. But it is only metaphorically true, not literally. This is a refutation of Mansur al-Halaj's proclamation of I am the truth. It is just that the spiritual state that certain Sufis are in sometimes overwhelms their senses and they end up blurting out things like this. This mistake is similar to what Christians do when they perceive divine qualities in Jesus and falsely conclude that he is Allah, Na'udhu Billah. This is like someone looking into a mirror, seeing a colored reflection and mistaking it for the mirror's own color. 
But actually, a mirror doesn't have its own color. It merely reflects the colors of the objects in front of it. The illusion is so strong that a child might see a person's reflection and think the person is actually inside the mirror. Very typical of how animals think they are seeing another animal in the mirror and then they start hitting the mirror. So it is from this end state goal that Imam Ghazali now says, let us pull back the reins of the discourse right here. For we have plunged into the depth of a shoreless sea and secrets like these ought not to be abused by putting them down in books. And since this was not intended but has happened by accident, let us re refrain from it and return to explaining in detail the meanings of the beautiful names of Allah. But unlike Imam Ghazali Rahmatullahi, Ibn Arabi goes forward into the Shoreless Sea and divulges the secrets of this path to an astonishing level. And that will form part of the next presentation on Islamic mysticism. We now come to the categorization of the names of Allah. Imam Ghazali Rahmatullahi categorized the 99 names of Allah into 10 boxes. Essentially, they are based on Allah's being and his actions. These categories are somewhat abstract to understand. And also, they cover just a subset of the 99 names. So these are the uh, categories, names indicating the essence of Allah, names that combine the essence with negation, names adding a quality to the essence, etc, etc. Now they are a bit difficult to understand, so I've provided here a su superhero analogy. You can pause the video at this point to have a bit more of an understanding of what Imam Ghazali is implying. An alternative characterization is based on the nature of a king. The description of a king would typically entail characterizing him as follows. First, by looking at his royal status, then the unique aspects of his being, and then how he deals with his kingdom. This is intuitive. It's easy to identify and recognize. It's also easy to internalize and manifest consciously. The following sequencing within each category is based on the descriptive meanings as posited by Imam Ghazali Rahmatullahi. In this description here, we can see Allah's royal attributes right at the top, then followed by attributes pertaining to his being or his innate attributes, then followed by attributes related to creation and how he deals with creation. First, with regards to his ownership of creation, then him providing for the creation, then his kindness towards his creation, then the knowledge that he has of his entire creation. And using this knowledge, he is then able to mete out justice to the creation. And he, he does this through his power. And that justice takes the form of a punishment. So this is a very easy to understand and sequential way to think of Allah's attributes. Moreover, the importance of having categorized it in this way is so that when you are trying to understand any certain specific name, you also see that name in context with the other similar names in that category. So then you have more of a holistic understanding of um, multiple names simultaneously. We will now summarize each category. And this will take the form of the recognition and embodiment of the names of each category. First and foremost, the proper noun, Allah, is a name signifying the true existent being, uniting all attributes of a divinity, embodying, embodying lordship qualities, and uniquely existing of itself. Every other existence derives from him and is transient except for his eternal essence. The name Allah is the greatest and most 
specific among the 99 names, exclusively referring to the divine essence, unlike other names that can have worldly analogues. And the idea is to aspire for Allah likeness, ta'alluh, cultivate a heart and aspiration wholly devoted to Allah, focusing solely on Him, seeking only His approval and fearing none but Him. In the first category of the royal attributes of Allah, the recognition here is first to recognize Allah's absolute authority and ownership by contemplating the significance of events in one's life, seeing them as part of a greater divine plan. Recognize attributes like Al-Malik and Al-Malik Al-Mulk by observing the intricate order, balance and dependency in nature, reflecting on the universe as a manifestation of Allah's absolute control. We also need to recognize that Allah is the most praiseworthy, deserving all devotion and respect, as you would a king. And how do we embody these attributes? We do so by fully submitting to Allah's will and trusting in His plans, especially during challenging times. We also need to reflect on Allah's transcendent supremacy and perfection by being a king over ourselves and by not giving in to temptations and ruling over our desires. In terms of the innate attributes, here we need to reflect on the natural world's ongoing cycles like day and night and life's beginnings and endings. This contemplation echoes the attributes of Al-Awwal and Al-Akhir, reminding us of Allah's eternal presence. Amidst the diversity of the world, recognizing the uniqueness and oneness in the universe's intricate design correlates with the attributes of Al-Wahid, the one unequaled, and Al-Ahad, the one. This realization points to Allah's unparalleled nature. And we embody these attributes in our actions and thoughts by embracing the transient nature of life and its continuity. And this helps to mirror the essence of Al-Awwal and Al-Akhir. This could involve mindfulness of life's fleeting moments and a focus on lasting impacts. Now let's look at the attributes related to creation. First, in terms of ownership. Here we recognize these attributes by witnessing life's transitions, acknowledging Allah as Muhe, the giver of life, and al mumit the giver of death, in life's cyclical processes. The birth of a new child, the growth of plants, the cycles of seasons, and even the passing of life all reflect the continuous cycle of creation and recreation. We embody this category of attributes by, for example, reflecting Allah's attributes of al-muhi in daily life, by actively caring for and nurturing those in need. This could be through volunteering, supporting charities, or simply lending a helping hand to those around you, thereby honoring the sanctity and importance of all life. Allah provides for all of His creation, and we recognize this category by recognizing Allah's attributes like Ar-Razak, the sustainer and provider in the daily provision of needs, whether it is the food that we eat, the air we breathe, or the knowledge we gain, all are forms of sustenance that Allah provides to His creation. And we embody Allah's attribute of Al-Wahhab, the giver of all things, by generously providing for others without seeking anything in return. This could be through charity, volunteering, or even simple acts of kindness, like helping a neighbor or feeding animals. Maintain a constant state of gratitude, regularly praising Allah for His blessings and encouraging others to recognize and appreciate Allah's greatness. There are many names regarding Allah's kindness to His creation. And we recognize Al-Wadud, the most loving, in the unconditional love and compassion experienced in life, such as the care that we get from our parents, the kindness from strangers, or the beauty of nature, these instant instances reflect a fraction of the divine love that Allah has for His creations. We identify with Al-Mu'min, the giver of faith and security, in the feelings of safety and security in one's life. 
This can be seen in the protection from harm, the feeling of peace in terms of turmoil, and the security found in faith and trust in Allah. We embody this category by reflecting on al-wadud in our actions by showing love and kindness to others, helping those in need without expecting anything in return, and forgiving those who may have wronged us. This mirrors the divine attributes of love and compassion. Allah has all knowledge over his entire creation. And we recognize every situation in life, be it tough or rewarding, is part of Allah's plan, bringing comfort and insight. Even hard times have deep wisdom and good in them, but this is known only to Allah. And we embody this category of attributes where we can emulate Allah's attribute of Al-Alim, the all-knowing, by constantly seeking knowledge and understanding in various fields, especially those that bring you closer to understanding Allah's creation and Allah's commands. This pursuit of knowledge not only honors the attribute of Al-Alim, but also helps in making informed, wise decisions in life, reflecting a small part of His infinite wisdom. We can also engage in regular reflection and mindfulness to cultivate an awareness which is akin to Allah's attribute of Al-Khabir, the totally aware. Allah meets out justice to His creation. And we recognize the concept of justice because this is evident when actions have appropriate consequences, both positive and negative. This could be observed in personal experiences, societal laws, or even in the natural cause and effect relationships. We can embody this category of names where individuals can manifest these attributes by ensuring fairness in their interactions and decisions. People can embody these attributes by being accountable for their actions, admitting to their mistakes, and making amends. Allah's power reigns supreme over the entire creation. The sheer power of Allah is evident in natural phenomena like thunderstorms, earthquakes, and the vastness of oceans. These forces, which are beyond human control, demonstrate the immense strength and control of Allah in the natural world. Individuals can embody and manifest these attributes by showing restraint and patience in the face of challenges, especially that true strength lies in self-control and the ability to overcome personal weaknesses. This reflects the understanding of Allah's overwhelming strength and the realization that true power is often demonstrated through patience and perseverance. Just as Allah's power is utilized for creation and sustenance, individuals can strive to empower others, be it through education, emotional support, or helping them to achieve their goals. And finally, something that everyone should be very concerned about is Allah's punishment. We need to recognize personal hardships and trials that they may sometimes be perceived as a form of divine discipline or correction. Reflecting on these challenges can lead to a deeper understanding of the balance between Allah's mercy and His justice, and how He guides and corrects through various means. Proud nations of the past who thought they were invincible were destroyed by Allah. We can embody this category of attributes in the following way. In the emulation of Allah's attributes of punishment, a person can practice self-discipline by holding themselves accountable for their own actions. This involves acknowledging and correcting one's mistakes, seeking forgiveness, and making sincere efforts to avoid repeating harmful behaviors. One can also actively work towards establishing justice and fairness in one's immediate environment. And this reflects the divine attribute of retribution. This can, can involve standing against oppression, supporting those who are wronged, and ensuring that actions do not contribute to injustice or harm towards others. Now let us look at the way forward. And having all of this information, where do we go to from here? The first thing I would say is 
we need to have an investigative attitude. Think like Sherlock Holmes. Here is an excerpt from the story, A Case of Identity. And Sherlock Holmes was written by the author Arthur Conan Doyle. The excerpt is as follows, where Sherlock Holmes is sitting in his front room, speaking to his companion, Watson, where he says, My dear fellow, said Sherlock Holmes, as we sat on either side of the fire in his lodgings at Baker Street, life is infinitely stranger than anything which the mind of man could, could invent. We would not dare to conceive the things which are really mere commonplaces of existence. If we could fly out of that window, hand in hand, hover over this great city, gently remove the roofs, and peep in at the queer things which are going on, the strange coincidences, the plannings, the cross-purposes, the wonderful chain of, chains of events, working through generations and leading to the most outrageous results, it would make all fiction with its conventionalities and foreseen conclusions most stale and unprofitable. In this overall investigative journey of discovery, it would probably be easiest to use this checklist to start recognizing and embodying alert names by category first, as given in the previous slides. You can then follow on with each name by having a detailed understanding of the names, as given in Imam Ghazali's 99 Names Kitab. The link to where this kitab can be purchased is given in the description below. And as you progress, you can then start ticking off na the names on this list. The PDF for this chart is also available in the description below. This slide here gives a 10-step procedure for the practical implementation of the names. You can pause the video here to go through each one of these points in, de in detail. Another really powerful way of interacting with the 99 names is to use them in synergy with other kitabs. So for example, this is uh, the opening chapter of the kitab called Ikhmal Shyam. The link for this kitab is also given in the description and is highly recommended. So the first point in this kitab talks about the existence of creation is with his command. B. In the presence of his unity, the one, the entire creation is annihilated and non-existent. So we can then start assigning names of Allah to different aspects of the kitab that we read. So for example, in here, we can see that the name Al-Khalik uh, is applicable, the name Al-Ahad is applicable. Uh, in the second point, if it was not for the illumination of his manifestation, the universe would not have been visible. Um, so the name An-Nur is uh, applicable here to this point. So the advantage of this here is that the 99 names helps us to recognize the points inside Ikhmal Shyam or in any other kitab for that matter. And then the points inside that kitab in turn have a synergistic effect because they help us to understand more of the names and especially how to embody the 99 names. So then the kitabs in conjunction with the 99 names gives you an extremely powerful insight. In conclusion, the, ob the objective is to recognize, contemplate, and embody the names of Allah. Obtain Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah's kitab on the 99 names of Allah and understand each name in detail. Make a checklist and each day aim for which names you want to focus on, recognizing and manifesting those names for that day. Eventually, you should reach a point where you have recognized and manifested all the 99 names in some way 
or the other, no matter how small. This is a lifelong process of continuously building on your recognition and, manif and manifestation of all of the 99 names of Allah, whether this is through engaging in a masnoon zikr or wazifa of each name, or as prescribed by a sheikh in seclusion, engage in muraqaba of that name and its associated Quranic verses. Emulate practical life examples from the lives of the prophets and the sheikhs of the past. And in conclusion, there is a very poignant quotation by Hazrat Abdul Qadir Jailani where he says, When the love of Allah arises in the hearts of the lovers of Allah, it takes over their bodies, their hearts, their spirits. It overpowers them, overwhelms them. It takes possession of them. It permeates their whole beings. They are given to see what others do not see, to hear what others do not hear and to enjoy the company of the best of all company. I wish you well on your quest for recognizing and embodying Allah's attributes. Jazakallahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.